Yeah. You know, Broward? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think I've been there. So, yeah, so yeah, yeah, no, I'm, I'm getting um, everybody's this emails. Is that okay? yeah. Last week we no. stopped pretty much with the idea of the city. Can I please have your attention? So, so we can plan cities completely constructed from scratch of certain visions and certain ideas to redesign the great city. Uh, it started out with ideas from Le Corbusier and, Le, uh, and um, Ebenezer Howard. Ebenezer Howard is the number, the name to remember when it comes to garden cities. Yeah? See, a beautiful movement came back out of this where we implement green space, vibrant neighborhoods, organically grown neighborhoods, the idea I don't need to live in a condominium tower, I do appreciate actually the grown old oak trees in front of the house. Yeah? Let's say New Hampshire versus Miami. Different players, different lifestyles. Yeah? Okay. We did this. Uh, Le Corbusier again presented the idea of how patterns will uh, be objective or actually being part on top of uh, cities. And we did this quite nice little sketch with, let's say, street grid. Remember, you've been sitting here in the front asking, hey, what about one way streets? Yeah? So when we come to patterns, we have to differentiate again on scale. Are we talking patterns at a neighborhood level, or the city level, regional level, or even national level? Yeah? What are the kind of ideas in regional development? Yeah? Example here, this is built on specific uh, patterns, the so-called quarters. Yeah? Le Corbusier, city of Chandigarh. This example again is the idea of how he would redesign the great city of Paris, and we all know how it ended up in those little project style town uh, towers. So, we also talked about systems of flow. We had this discussion about what are systems of flow. Well, they come in patterns, they deal with costs, we have, let's say, maintenance, we have to deal with those systems. When we talk sure about systems that? for yeah, what? Right now, sure. Any idea yeah. what kind of system of flow do we have? Information, Information communication. Mind. What else? People. People. Movement of goods, wastes, water, air, pressurized systems. Good water, bad water. <laughs> no? yeah, I think hers is the canals, we have as drainage systems. Um, we also discussed very briefly the idea of do you have a gravity fed sewer system or a, a, a pressurized sewer system? It makes a huge difference if you're like a little satellite subdivision. You gotta deal with the county in certain uh, time, but how do you deal actually with the utilities? Yeah? So that's one thing to remember when we talk about systems of flow. Uh, what I mean here with sketch is that I pretty much had a brainstorming session uh, on, on uh, my script and we talked about capacity. Huh? When we talk about capacity, let's say systems of flow would be infrastructure and street, could be infrastructure and rail, could be air traffic. There's a certain amount of capacity I can add to a normal load or to the peak amount. Peak amount is interesting. At lunch yesterday with a major developer in town or in the region. The amount of office space allowed on their development was leveled, they couldn't go higher than the X amount, because of the peak amount of traffic to the peak hours, peak amount, peak hours on, nine, five, uh, on uh, I 95 at those two exits and uh, on ramps they are adjacent to. Yeah? Why? Because the Metropolitan Planning Organization and the Federales are saying this is at maximum capacity already, you just can't add more to it. Think about this. We have a pine class, take a picture and pour more beverages in that pine class. For demonstration purposes, let that be water. That pine class will overflow at some time if you don't keep drinking it. Huh? So the drinking part is the capacity, one sip per minute. If you add 10 sips per minute, at some time it will overflow. It's a very stupid example, but on a Friday after, Saturday afternoon at 2 p.m., this is what you will remember when we talk about capacity peak amount. Huh? 
overflowing barrels. All right, so that impacts your utility systems. Peak amount can be demand and supply. If everyone flushes the toilet at the same moment, water pressure goes down in the system, unless you plan for it and have a higher pressurized system. That's an important factor when I talk about fire uh, suppression systems. You know? When I talk about fire systems in, in general, if you have commercial real estate, let's say warehousing, uh, literally warehouse logistics, at some size of that warehouse, you will have to have a specific pressurized system in place. If the city that supports your water doesn't have the enough water pressure at the site, you might end up actually with a pressurized fire station, aka enough water in tanks with fire pumps to sprinkler the whole building for a certain amount of time. It goes back into the construction class when we talk about how long a specific wall can withstand fire until it deteriorates a certain radius. You know? So next time you walk around and look at fire hydrants, it's a purpose why they are red, blue, or um, red, blue, or um, yellow. They are reflect the color code of the fire hydrant reflects the water pressure in the system. Uh -huh. so, so a yellow hydrant is different from a red hydrant. Yeah, depending on which state or region you are in. Really? Wait, which one's high pressure? Which I would have to look that up. Can't remember. But yeah, it's different. And but what? the fun fact is, if let's say if you live in a hilly area foothills, if you do a fire insurance, sign up for house insurance for the fire protection of your house, they will ask you how far away the next fire station is. They will ask you how far away the next fire hydrant is, you know, because an engine only has a certain amount of water in their tank and then they need a tanker or a connection to the system. But they don't ask you what's the pressure in the pipe? No? And it goes so detailed that, let's say, uh, the town I used to work for, they did so help in some larger fires in the city of Dover. And it went downhill, or went down to the fire, the water pressure in the pipes, so they didn't have two trucks coming from the south. No, they had Dover from the south already in place, and support coming from north, which was more drive time to get there, but they had been on a different water main. So they didn't tap from the same pipe. They came from two different systems and pressurized systems and could uh, work on the, uh, fight the fire from both sides. Does it make a difference when the town or the area has a, um, a uh, the, the, the water? Water tower? Yeah, the water tower as well. Because I know that that adds to the, uh, to the pressure. That's how you pressurize the system. Correct. Yeah. But does that make a difference to the fire hydrant? Depends on the pipe <laughs> and the elevation of the hydrant. Not all water e systems, delivery systems are equal. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. why they put the tower on. Yeah. So um, in certain areas, uh, you will see different color codes. If it could be simple like that. Still a red fire hydrant, but maybe a blue cap. Could be just the top marking. Mm -hmm. and the firefighters will know what kind of pressure that is. Like blue uh, is the big one. Blue is the fifteen hundred psi high. There's some that don't that are that they're not painted, but the top is like. That's that. a color code for pressure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I learned that when I started doing mapping on GIS with fire hydrants. Fire hydrants are my friends. They paid for two US degrees. <laughs> Seriously. Wrote software maintaining fire hydrants. Huh? Not laughing, this is true. Paid for PhD. More power things. Alright, so again I want you to remind you guys like the patterns of channel, page number 40 as an example. Is an example here for how the design has advantages and disadvantages. We did that scribbly notes about different how different subdivisions can be laid out and uh, set up. Yeah. And but we didn't talk about walking. We didn't talk about interchangeability of those. We didn't talk about scale. Yeah. So when I look at walking, it comes to my mind. Hey, we need to talk about residential scale versus regional scale. Walking here on this campus works. If, you're, if you know where to walk, signage is a problem. They're working on that, but it's now better than two years ago. But if you walk from here, you're easily able to reach all major critical points here on campus. 
Yeah? Walking from the new dorm towers to uh, the, pub, uh, the medical school, that's a stretch. Yeah? Um, I'm kind of surprised if we don't have enough, not, not yet so many skateboards or bicycles on, on campus. I will still wait until I get run over by them mm -hmm. uh, or, or scooters. Yeah. But again, um, walking, other transportation, keep that in mind. Um, Uber made a revolution in terms of short term or short distance transportation compared to camp, uh, taxi drivers. Yeah. But it's also, if you come back at 1 a.m. in the morning to, for another airport, you might want to wait 10 minutes and your Uber drops by $15. Huh? Because that one big terminal demand is just gone, you're just chilling, and you save $15 uh, for the same trip. Huh? Because they do this price demand model, nobody really knows about, but they're doing different pricing. Huh? But cab drivers did just for that, the base rate with Uber is pretty much now the base rate with the cab drivers too. Before it was 50 50. First time I came here, Uber was actually half the price to get to, air, to the airport. Now it's uh, ten dollars more than two, two years ago. Mm. Uh, so there are different stories to that. Uh, scooters, electric scooters, those li little lime scooters, yeah. for downtown, fantastic. I wouldn't really do it downtown as all us doing the office hours. Yeah. But last conference I did in San, uh, San Diego, CS conference, I do this whole thing on sneakers. Yeah. Like you walk miles and miles and miles inside the conference and outside, block by block. They have the scooters now. Wow, miles and miles and miles and scooters. Why do you walk six blocks when you do 50 miles per hour with no helmet and crash into a truck? It didn't happen to me, but a friend of mine, little, like, whoop, there he goes. Uh, hierarchies of flow systems. It's an interesting thought. Yeah? We have that in a perfect setup with traffic. We have the loop, we have the cul-de-sac, the dead end street, minor streets, collectors, major arterials, regional connectors, interstates. I like the blood system transporting different amount of blood in your system, cardiovascular system. You know, your veins, arterials, all that. Think about that. So hierarchies of flow system. They are by capacity and flow speed in the difference. You can interchange them or even terminal them. Low tuned connection. Yeah? Dead end streets again to hops. When we talk about capacities, you might want to consider capacities and costs. Circulation can be most expensive on site development. Yeah? Single line heavily developed uh, as a part of the, um, is the cheapest. So then one of the next assignments is going to be a side plan sketch, where we actually try to build a small little 10 acre-ish, 14 acre-ish development, arranging some of our functions we select earlier. Remember, we talk about linkages, site design. What are the functions I want to put on a site? Yeah? How do they deal with distance and access between those functions on that site? And then how I manifest that into my physical layout, what we call site plan. Yeah. So in two weeks, we have this little assignment due where we actually do a sketch on a site in north of Cincinnati, which shows us a blank slate. It's completely built out now. So don't cheat yourself when you Google Maps it. Don't take a look at what is there. Yes, there is a hotel. No? Don't place your hotel if you come up with the idea of hotel right in the same direction as the hotel. It's just taking the fun out of it. No? The idea is the very little information you have about that side it used to be an eminent domain case, three eminent domain cases, so the eminent domain cases of Ohio. No? You want to develop that site as in the is retail and this mini mall shopping center level already on the south side. Interstate access is as an on-ramp exit there. Yeah. And you want to make sure that all the uses you have, that you get a little bit dated, 2016, 2017, retail leakage report. So what's needed in that area, what's not needed in the area. If you have five Burger Kings, you don't put the fifth burger, uh, seventh Burger King in there. Doesn't make sense. Yeah. So the encouragement is to work a little bit with that blank part and get you excited. This is different from the reverse design. 
because in the reverse design you got a little bit constrained with that structure on the side already, the black and white lines. You know? This time it's blank. So if you decide you want to do a grid pattern, do a grid pattern. If you want to decide I want to do one or two big layouts on cul-de-sac, uh, sorry, roundabouts, do that. We will talk about that next week. Uh, actually, remind me, let's talk about this week, because next week the end of the session is uh, midterm. You know? But I also delayed that sketch part, so you actually have the chance to meet Kona Gray as a uh, partner from EDSA Plan, uh, landscape architecture guy. Um, so he presents a bunch of ideas and how they develop the site plans and all that. So you get a little bit more inspiration and it's like, hey, I saw this last week, I can implement that. Yeah? Knowledge transfer. When you talk about capacity and cost, specialize to reduce the cost, and then maybe think about what's going on with the physical site development, you know, the typology of your site. Uh, is that actually relevant? Do you need, how much do you need to do a grading work? Do you change the patterns of existing water bodies? No? It's important here in Florida. Every time you touch environmental work, you gotta justify it. You might actually get slapped under your hands. No, no. Existing water body can change that. Important to remember. All right? That's as much as I have as the finish of chapter four. This is an example here for the um, Config page, again, it's almost like a GIS class, different layers, or different components in real life. Physical space is certainly of interest in this class, but we are going more and more in that direction, the upper direction, when you talk about more complex issues. Uh, if we have a chance to do a, a, a small discussion on housing, uh, you will see that there is definitely economic status and family status the problem. Uh, SES, social and economic status, is probably one of the most health threats you can see in communities right now. I can, as the saying about, I can tell you, you tell me which zip code you live in, and I can tell you what kind of diseases you will die from. Uh, that's not funny. Seriously, not. Um, you can look at, and if you have been living in different places, you have experienced different neighborhoods. Um, just to think about this. The status and the perception of, let's say, crime in your neighborhood determines how safe you feel. The less safe you feel, the more stress you have about your personal health and well-being. If you walk through a neighborhood, you know it's dangerous, and you stop at every intersection with no traffic, just to look left and right over your shoulder, to see who is walking behind you, so you might not get mugged. You walk into your apartment, you have three deadbolts on your apartment door, so nobody can kick in your door to get to rob your apartment while you're not there. That's a different neighborhood appeal than you roll up to a gated community, wave your residence card or get barcode scan on your car, and you drive through a separate unit and then you press the button of your um, garage opener and you're home. Next time you walk through a different city, different urban space, think about that. New York City, there are cars in New York City, I look around. Even on Broadway, depends on which street you're at. Yeah. You know that. Um, my example is Cincinnati. When I was in Cincinnati, I had neighborhoods where everyone said, well, gotta be careful. We had students at the urban campus, we had students, that case actually was a fake, marked, allegedly marked in front of the college. Because it was college, large street, neighborhood. College was in a dead end street on a hill. I had people shooting uh, shootouts in the parking garage of the college. Or the garage next to the college. What was this? University of Cincinnati 15 years ago. No? 10, 15 years ago. All these crazy stories. This is one event in that year. Crazy person walks into the parking garage, Indian students in the garage, fire three or four shots to the, uh, into the garage direction of the car, disappears. Crazy story. Huh? 
being marked here and there was not a surprise. Boom, design student, thousand dollar laptop, gone. No? Can happen. We had this recently here at the beginning of the year. Remember the first day of school, first night of school? We had a shooting in one of the neighborhoods, uh, shopping centers here, and someone got shot in the leg. Did impact our community. Our alarm system went off. Remember that? First day of class, two messages in the morning, hey, stay away on campus, stay safe, and then at 4 a.m., 10-4, all clear, everything is fine. Different perception of space. No? So we do have to talk about conflict, or you have to accept that there is conflict. Homeowner association fight about how the landscaping looks bad. That's a piece of cake when you move out in different regions and different countrysides. No? Trespassing in Idaho, Montana when you go fishing. Uh, hope, uh, the farmer stands there with a rifle and tells you you're trespassing and cocks the gun. Happened to me. Good luck. Private property. Private property on a path. Huh? Or Pocatello, Idaho, coming in with a planning director for Plain County with two students doing wildfire research that canyon burned a year, one and a half years earlier before that. We're standing there, kid wants to walk down the street because literally from the distance from this wall to this wall, you could see the red left over fire retardant, where the air aircraft dropped the fire retardant on the wildfire. Yeah. Next house is the palm tree outside of the window. That close. Kid walks on the street, the student walks out. Guy with a big dog walks out of his house. It's a private property. You're trespassing. Different perspective, uh, perspective of private property. We get there. We're talking about legal stuff soon. Yeah. Um, we're like, yeah, yeah, university planning director would like to. No, private property. But you can talk to me. This guy knocked at the door. Firefighter, you have two minutes to evacuate your house. Take the dog. Take your papers. Go. Yeah. Last one. They had homes, the lily, the siding of the home burned, uh, melted off because it was final siding, and the wildfire went through, so close to the canyon. All right, scary story. We are talking here about, again, physical space, economic status, and the way you build and you design your spaces, you create a conflict. Yeah? Remember, when you talk about space design, every time we design spaces, we create places. Okay, what are places? Places are spaces with felt value, identity, and culture. Oh, you can mix that. Felt value, identity, culture, culture, identity. Chinatown, Little India, as an example. Home sweet home. Yeah? If you buy a new house, it takes a while to call this your home because people say you've got to put your own dirt in it. Yeah? You can clean this out, you buy it from someone else. Put some new paint on it, you decorate it, takes a moment. You're not really saying, ah, oh, my home the first day. It takes a moment. Paying it with his family home, single family home, kind of take a little bit of landscaping and gardening until you call it that. You know? And pictures on the wall. So take some time. All right. visual form. <coughs> this is where I like <clears throat> your design background you're like wow he is a little bit out of his mind uh, the author but it also is really interesting here. Um, I want to point out a few things. This goes down to human activity. Yeah? Um, On the next few slides, I'm literally presenting you guys texture for flooring. Yeah, an example is how that, remember, how examples in the real world. 
remember when I told you guys next time you walk into the mall, take pictures of the flooring? Think about that. You walk out here on carpet, different set of carpet outside, and you actually have mar something marble tiles on the hallway, but the atrium is like marble as well. Small little detail. You know? We've been joking just recently about um, a friend of us, John Auerbach, that starts residential division. <coughs> he's making a joke. He's building Las residence of Las Olas and other projects, like 140... I know it's 42 floors. Actually. 42 floors condominium rented towers. Yeah? He was joking about the amount of time he's going to spend or always has to spend on paint samples and marble samples for the interior design, as in this is going to be kitchen number one, this is going to be kitchen number two, this is bathroom number two. Yeah? And the little details you present. Here. Yeah, so there's a change. 40 kitchens because they have the round course. Yeah, can happen. Well, they come to the development world. But clarity, meaning, senselessness, stimulus, pleasure, and disgust are certain things that we experience when we enter spaces. Uh, I'm not sure if it's in that slide or in, uh, coming. You can even say we experience spaces, in, uh, uh, spaces and places in different ways. Smell is one. You close your eyes and you imagine walking into your grandma's home, grandma's kitchen, you're thinking cookies. Uh, some, something smells. Good experience. If I say let's go to the sewer station to, and do, talk about sewer management, yeah, sewer treatment plan, you imagine immediately, oh, this might smell terrible. Not all the locations and facilities in sewer treatment do smell bad. Only one. Everything else is actually pretty clean. Yeah. What else? Well, we're talking about visual form, but what else could impact the experience of your spaces and places? Uh, uh, yeah. Light. 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 If I give this lecture in a complete dark room, you're falling asleep. Yeah? It's uh, uh, put a thousand lumen beam in here, I can blind you. Light is a huge factor. Yeah? Do a movie night on Saturday evening and staying at home. You, know? you dim the light in your living room probably to have that movie theater experience. You don't put every light on bright to do that. You know? um, light is good. Light can cause panic and uh, distraction. Being over, the t over time, it has changed. Parking structures. Parking structures have more light than they used to do. Parking structures, in terms of pattern and arrangements, also now have what? family and women parking spots close to bright light areas and high traffic areas like elevator and exit entry uh, and to increase safety perception so you do you don't as a woman you don't have to walk three stars uh, falls down into the dark 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 garage that's how horror movies and action movies starts uh, hello someone here ding, 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 ding. Uh, not just highlight like that okay Try to visualize a few things from movies, always. Um, think about light, Batman movie, in bright light scenery. Wouldn't work. Huh? No, it's always a little bit dark and suspense. How about design? The design, like? In general, design, yeah. Okay. We had light. Temperature. Temperature. That's the difference between this classroom and a computer lab. Yeah. In the long run, you will feel more tired in here than in the computer lab. I always switch down the temperature in my classrooms. Because over time, you're actually feeling more refreshed, but you might get, get cold. Uh -huh. Is there a reason like testing facilities are freezing cold? Does that make you more alert? Or? No, it's just being mean from the facilities oh. people. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. Uh, so we have design, and it comes back into light, into a noise. Uh, noise, noise. Uh, color selection. Temperature is good. Smell is good. Noise. No, it's a color selection. Color selection. Yeah. There's a difference between a bright red wall versus this kind of doomed sand colors. Yeah. All of the above in this mix can make a difference. I can have this room with no furniture. I can have this room with cocktail tables or as is. Same square footage, different feel, how it looks and how it's perceived. So think about that. When we design spaces at small scale, site plan, 
where to place buildings. When we talk about where to place buildings, maybe rotate more. Rotation of a building over there, the huge impact, just visually, in the feel and the general story of that space. Yeah? Shopping malls are perfect done, perfectly done in that kind of design. Walt Disney wrote books about that. Remember the snake that walked the waiting line? That the snake is a Walt Disney invention, at least dedicated to Walt Disney. Wait, what? Wait, what are you talking about? The snake. What the snake? The wait line in front for the for oh, the, the wait line. Oh, the waiting yeah, line. Yeah, yeah. Okay. That's the difference. So what did they design it? Yeah, it's just to make, make, make use of the room. Yeah. There's a difference between one line or doing this like this. <laughs> yeah, it may save space, obviously. No. <clears throat> Let's turn it on. Let's just do this the other way. Safer to evacuate. Uh, perception of this. Proceed is shorter. 100 feet long. You're walking by and say, hey, on that right, there's a 100 feet line. Are you going to do it or not? No. Is it Disney? Yeah, it's Disney. Universal. Universal 100 feet for Harry Potter. <laughs> so, what if, if you have a nice little facade <coughs> of the gate and then you come in and it's like this? And here's your right. I know the angle for you is bad. Difference between that? Oh, yeah, I'm doing it. Difference between that? Two and a half hours? Are you crazy? I'm yeah, not going to stand in line for two and a half hours for a two minute ride. Huh? So how the people overcome that is, in the theme parks, is there is, let's say, a single rider. Single rider, same entrance, might be this. Fast path. Fast path? <laughs> <It's> that. <laughs> <laughs> but you pay for it. Yes. Yeah? All right. So think about that. If someone is a smart ass, that's a French term for, I want to overthink the system, you go a single rider because you're old enough and you don't need to ride the roller coaster sit, sitting next to each other. It's a roller coaster experience, it's not your friend or your nephew screaming next to you. Yeah? So you're moving, person experience, you're moving from 15 to 20 minutes wait time, riding a roller coaster into two minutes wait time at a single rider. Only works if regular peak amounts are in or work. Um, system loads are in place, regular capacity in place. If you try to do that on Christmas, where the park is completely flooded with people, you have two and a half hours for Harry Potter. They close the single rider because single rider is now flooded with people who are saying, we're not going to wait two and a half hours. We are going four people, we're going on single rider and hop in and sneak in. Yeah? And fast pass, yeah, they let you go because you're still paying $100 or $80 that day. That day. Yeah? But they change the system and the flow in the capacity with that. It's a weird example, but it's actually fitting for a Florida setup. For those who haven't been there yet, it's actually cool. All right. What do we mean with landscape of Western culture? different type of uh, ground. Western culture is more desert-like. Is it Western culture as Midwest and Wild West, or is it Western culture as in Middle East versus Europe versus United States, or even Asia, Middle East, Europe, US? East Coast versus West Coast, I'm saying. All right, we can go with that and then reach if you accept the scale of the U.S., it's, yeah. right it's a completely different point of view if you're talking Eastern European, Europe, United States, like that. If I find my clicker, I could switch to the Yeah. Well, also interesting here is a side note. Western culture. In 1992 or 98? 98. Samuel... P. Huffington. Huffington. Huntington. Huntington wrote a book called The Clash of Civilizations, which is kind of eye opening that he pointed out what kind of conflicts we will have in the next 15 to 20 years. Water battles. 
clean water battles in the Middle East, that's going to be the lead geopolitical issue. And I don't want, don't want to divert from that too much. But the first chapter talks about that Western culture and the perception of the West versus the East. Well, it depends how you look at it. Because I can stand in the West, look to the East, and have a different perception of Western culture, and I can do this the other way around. It works both ways. So don't, lessons learned from that chapter is don't be extremely judgmental. It works both ways. Mm -hmm. yeah? So have a considerate, moderate thought about, again, when you build places, you're creating cultural identical uh, cultural creating culture identity and felt value. And the felt value is part of the visual form. Right. Spatial dimensions are reinforced by light, color, texture, and detail. Kind of started out doing that. Yeah? Texture right now, carpet floor, flat wall. Huh? So you ever heard of a poodle list? Poodle list, this is a side note here. You should know that as an architect. <laughs> Who has an urban planning architectural background here? Andrew, architect. Yeah. You ever heard about this? Yeah, that really. <laughs> Brutalism? Yeah, it's this. All right. What's that? <laughs> Government. A lot of concrete. <laughs> <laughs> Government building. <laughs> Overbuilt? No. That's the... J. Edgar Hoover building as the official, yeah. still the official headquarters of the FBI in Washington, D.C. Remember, I keep telling you guys, walk around, take pictures. Brutalism. Brutalism is using a really cool um, building material that was really started to get established in the 60s. Uh, Europe, here a little bit earlier. We call it concrete. Oh, we kind of built still like this. But brutalism also kind of built that super nature of, of humans, no, the super nature of building versus humans by building design and material. You know? um, it's intimidating. That's the best example for that. Brutalism really like bold, big moves in architecture. This is the new thing we can do. New materials. Let's build with this. Yeah? And the reason I try to inflect that because there's this one guy who used concrete in the most artistic way, beautiful way, and he was um, coming in a few slides. Um, this looks like the police um, headquarters in Robocop. Yeah? I don't actually you know what's the CPE building. I just Googled brutalism pictures, and I missed actually even the URL for that. I want to talk about calm. That's not Genghis Khan. Oh, that's not Genghis Khan, that's, that's Khan. Uh, the wrong Khan. This is Dunin Singh Khan from the old Star Treks. Yeah? Um, this is not Cumberbatch. That's before the Cumberbatch guy. I want to talk about this guy. Louis Khan. Uh, Estonian born architect. Uh, came to the US um, and had some really, really cool things going on. Please stay with me and wander off on this, but this is important, this is inspirational. How we can use concrete to do really cool looking stuff. Yeah? This chapter uh, is about light, dimensions, design, where you have perspective in a space as well. The little pictograms are awesome, like super simple, but they're really cool. This guy um, did know how to deal with this. If you have time, a re video recommendation, not a book. It's, there's a movie out, it's called My Architect. Yeah? Really cool story, it's his son from an affair, office affair. His son produced a movie about his father, Louis Kahn. Yeah? We call it My Architect, literally the autobiography, and it's saying, hey, this is how I perceive my dad, when he was working in his office in Philadelphia. And um, this is how our relationship, father-son father relationship, father -son relationship worked out or not. Really cool thing. It's one of those architects you don't actually know as the big name, but nice when it comes to working with materials. 
here. This is a concrete ceiling. This looks like a honeycomb. You know, if you look carefully, actually, it lights up for hexagons. You know? So if you look carefully, like here, this is a stuff like hexagons are. You know? But this little ceiling light gives you a shine. Uh, remember, we did the reverse design. A few miles south, a few miles north of our little neighborhood, we did the reverse design. This is the administrative building, National Parliament. This is all concrete. Look at the reflections on the water pool, water with that sign. For the time being, we're not going to jump on Google and look at that. Yeah? The Salt Institute, which is in the West Coast, I think. All of this is concrete. Little condominium research base. Yeah? There's a little groove in there. Beautiful ideas. How tall are, are, are those sound? One, two, three, four floors. Fifty feet. If you less than that, because it's not probably in retail even twelve feet. So very interesting. Salt Institute, Google it, get inspired with the pictures. Um, this is a de defining light, a defining space with light material and the feel. This feels very warm. This feels very inviting. Uh, this is a library building, the interior of a library. So compared to the FBI building, concrete, openings, roundings, all that, yeah, very inspirational. All right, just a small little story about this guy. Again, beautiful story in terms of a shared story. Heartbroken guy from Estonia. Uh, apparently, social life miserable. Uh -huh. But in terms of work, interesting. Uh, a few things I want to point out. Kind of this lecture today is built on one or two of the quotes that really, really um, stand out when you read this. Yeah? Spaces differ in character according to their intrinsic proportions. Uh -huh. Goes down to, has scale. This, this position and arrangement of the objects, odor, shade, we have light, you know? shade is important as well. Uh, if you do uh, outside, outside landscaping, well, if you actually really put uh, sidewalks in place, you might want to consider how to shape them, by plants or by buildings, so people are not going burning up in 95 degrees blue sky sun. You know? They differ in their character, they differ in their spatial effect, so keep in mind the movement and the circulation as well. Yeah? The distance, the perception, and the context. When I talk about space has scale, there's this little sketch of this little person in the back where you have... Imagine you're sitting somewhere and you see someone approaching you from far, far away. Yeah? So you have one person in a short distance scale, or you have the person in a far out scale. Uh, different perspect perspective and how you build that. You also have this little sketch in the book on this one where they have like a perspective tunnel and they have like a furniture piece in there, and suddenly the whole relationship of space is changing. Uh, we do that, this is a view, viewing point example. We do vary, vary in the effect on that. How do we enter a classroom? How do you enter a classroom while the lecture is in session? In the back. In the back and? Quietly. And if you have boombox on the sh shoulders, no, quiet. You sneak in. And the professor still calls you out, you're late. Huh? Sorry. Not okay. Hey, have no shame. I had, I had guest speakers calling out students sneaking in. Very bad experience for both of them. <laughs> also very bad. Day. Let's say it like this. In summary, since I since I spilled that story, in summary, that student went through hell that day. First by guest speaker, then personal stuff. Everything is solved. Everything is fine. But once in a while, 
you have a bad day. We had two this morning bad moments. So it can happen. Huh? All right. The way we enter this team, this team, this team. What did I say earlier? When I look at your site plan on your first plot models. The flow of traffic. How we, how we flow of traffic. And I don't like the way I enter this space right now. That's what we consider a gateway function. Huh? Two tower figures. Maybe you do two towers like this or like this. I don't know. Maybe you build this up, different perspective. You know. So this is where you come in and it's like, make, does this make sense? How do I enter my space? You know. Um, again, Disney World Universal, Universal Studios. How do you enter? You walk through this kind of plant development with retail and food around that lake. You see the rotating globe, and then you're at the gate. Huh? Versus Disney, where they say every day is an experience. You come there for an experience. Huh? Ribbon cut ceremony. Cut. Go in. Huh? Different experience on how you uh, do the space. Huh? They differentiate between their use. This is a classroom. For him, it's almost a, a bedroom. Oh, come on, big up. It's not that boring. Yeah. Uh, in their use, you enter the office spaces of your professors in a different way than you enter the classroom. Particularly, you don't know if we are lurking behind our door and waiting for you. In a good way. Huh? Daytime, night. What do I mean they differ by daytime and night? The light is different. different. Right. The lighting is different. The lighting is different. Your experience is different. Your experience is different. Can you elaborate on the experience? Like downtown and any city in the daytime is different from downtown. Like it's, uh, a, like it's a restaurant in the daytime and then at the nighttime it's like a party. Different city. different uses. What about mixed use? You have retail, office, and residential. You have different day population and different night population. Like the movie theater during the day. Yeah. Movie. So think about that. When you design spaces, when you talk about development for something, what's your daytime population, what's your nighttime population? Do they conflict with each other? Is it people that are only here for 15 minutes or three hours? You know, 15 minutes, pharmacy. Three hours, very expensive restaurant. Huh? You might even consider a valet service, but um, they have the parking area somewhere else. Yeah. Occupancy, vacancy makes a huge difference. You're walking through a small supermarket, a small uh, shopping mall, yeah, where every shop is filled with people and open. That's different from every other shop is boarded up or under renovation. The perception of oh, this is dead space, why am I shopping here? Versus, ooh, this is vibrant, this is really cool, I want to be here, I want to spend money. Yeah. This background music, it makes me happy, the light is beautiful. Yeah. Different perception of space. Um, large folks that work for larger developers. The way you design the lobby. The walk from your parking deck into your condominium tower can be mind-blowing sad or can be exciting versus could be oh you're home versus welcome home you left your work day in your car you know lobbies huge difference think about it a lot, of, a lot of glass in the back where you can see the pool when you walk into like a lobby. welcome versus oh what you're doing here some waterfalls yeah perception is traditional bank building Fortified, don't even think about coming in here to get money from me. Versus, welcome to paradise. This is the new condominium tower. We have three different pools and a massage service. No? Different feel. Think about how recent developments in, in Miami and Fort Lauderdale do their marketing. This is all happy place. Everything is great. No? Versus, dumpster is not, was, or the, the dirt and dumpster around the corner. Again, perception, perception, perception. Yeah. And if something is being taken away from this, is A, this is exam relevant, and B, think about how you perceive space next time and you walk around, drive around. Yeah. I don't know. It's a difference. I'm kind of confused when it comes to like um, the uh, daytime population versus nighttime population because 
if you're in a downtown area and you live downtown, there's a different population that's going to live there uh, during the during the nighttime versus All right, people let's that are working. Give you an example. Let's say um, let's keep your stats oriented because we're a start school of real estate development. Um, I don't work in downtown, but I might run into you at eight o'clock at Yolo, right next to Styles and having a drink. Yeah? Because for me, it's the destination of dinner out and a drink. Yeah? For you, it's just to walk around the neighborhood because you have an uh, apartment, uh, you rent an apartment or you own a condominium just around the corner. Yeah? So, and you work during the day in downtown. So for you, your day or the day population in downtown is those that live there and work there. The night population, uh, this example, would be, I'm part of the night population because I come for destination food and drink. But you're still part of the night population because you're a resident of that space. Extreme example. The city of Wilmington in Delaware, uh, because of the Delaware Banking Act, uh, your credit card statement comes from Wilmington, Delaware. Had the Bank of America, yeah, huge bank building. There was a few years ago, would have to update the data. They are saying the city of Wilmington had something like 60 to 80, 80,000 people as residents. Mm -hmm. But during the day, that inner core of the city would swell up to 160,000, 140,000. At 60 to 80,000 people more because of commuting in. Oh, wow. huh? So if you are at 8.30, 9 o'clock on 5.95, there's a huge influx on 595 going at least to 95, if not even then splitting up Miami versus the West Palm downtown for the holiday. Wow. There's a huge 4 or 5 o'clock, that avalanche of metal is moving out again to those who can live in Reston or Plantation and work downtown. We have board members with office space in downtown for the holiday, live in Pemple Pines or in Weston area. So that is that commute you have. So pretty much to make this short, every office space in downtown, like physical desk, that is occupied by a human person, you have to check if that person is commuting in or just walking around the corner. That's your day population. That's a huge traffic problem if you look at that pattern. Rush hours. What do you what do you don't want to do during the week at five o'clock? Leave this campus. Friday at three o'clock, don't even think about it. Why? Because around the corner is the high school and the people uh, the kids are getting picked up. Completely gridlocked. The backup from the university drive goes almost to the business school. Friday around three o'clock. Leave at two forty five or I leave at four. Or at seven to avoid all the traffic. No? So you literally, you start learning when, when you move to different places, you start learning the new patterns. Simple thing, when is your dress pickup? Do you live in a space, uh, do you have a dress shoot where you just drop it and it goes down? Or do you live in a neighborhood where you need to know, ah, Wednesday morning is my recycling pickup. It's not Saturday, it's Wednesday. Saturday is regular trash. Different spaces, different setups, communities, culture. It starts with trash pickup. Culture also, is your neighbor really a fan of you smoking meats or not? <laughs> here's, a pound, here's a pound of bacon, are we cool now? Yeah, it works. Uh, there is a barrage of things why spaces can differ. Sometimes it's a positive reinforcement, sometimes it's scary. Yeah? So remember that there are different ways. We're going to take a look at a little bit more because it's design oriented on the way they're entered. Yeah? San Diego. Think about this. They put an arch up across the street and saying the historic heart of San Diego, the gas lamp district. They have, for a few dozen of street blocks, they're showing the pride of this historical neighborhood. Yeah? Uh, it's a rendering. Yeah? But imagine you actually go, drive down the street and says, hello, hello, greetings, greetings, greetings. 
uh, making place making identifier side. City of Cincinnati did something cool. They had on and off giraffes in the suit. So what they did is they had lights like this that ended here with the lamp. They put literally covered the lamp posts and the top with giraffe pads. I don't have a picture of that, but it was the most beautiful marketing campaign ever. And it said on it, the giraffes are back. All over downtown, every lamp post had a giraffe face and the, the neck pads. They used the lamp posts in a crea creative way. Beautiful fun. Huh? Huh. Sensed by vision, sunlight, artificial light, sensed by hearing. We talked about noise. You walk into a different room, carpet or no carpet. Hello? Boom, boom, echo. Yeah? Can make a difference. The small spaces, etc. If you're in a sound booth in a radio station, it really sounds funny. Why? Because you actually usually have headphones on and a microphone. Uh, don't uh, make sure that no other noise can echo off from the wall. Crowdform. This is where he talks a little bit again about the idea of, um, we talk about sounds and spaces, okay. Uh, Crowdform, this is where it gets a little bit, I want to say, weird off. The configuration of floor is determined by pre-existing topography, which is actually really cool. Why? Because, yeah. Because you want to see how you have to change space. If you're living in a hillside community, well, you accept that there's a certain slope that predetermines how you develop the land. Here in South Florida, great plan out, level everything. All the elevations you can see, all the water features are artificially planted. Remember that one city I showed you guys with, uh, from Malaysia, a really long stretch where we did actually field trip years ago? There used to be a banana plantation or some plantation thing. That lake was artificial. They kind of digged that out and flooded it. Yeah? Completely artificial. Why not? Yeah? Um, there's also the say here, the site disrupts, the, the plan disrupts the site. This is the first chapter in this uh, class. So, so the question is, to which extent will real estate development disrupt the existing conditions? I kind of answered that. Huh? We have the kind of easy function right now where we say topography doesn't exist. Trees is the enemy of real estate development in Fort Lauderdale. Everyone you talk to, existing trees, Fort Lauderdale, they will say we gotta mitigate those or we gotta build around those. Huh? They're not really your enemy, but in terms of planning regulations and development regulations, you got to compensate for that. So when we have in two weeks, we're going to have uh, Robert Ch uh, Bob Shapiro uh, visiting us and giving a, a, his talk, his mini session about um, uh, Dana Point. At lunch with him, had a tour with him yesterday. This place is just mind blowing big, two and a half million square foot. You know? Hotels, apartment buildings, retail, all that. Secrets to come out soon. Yeah. Um, but it was really interesting to see they put about a million dollars into tree mitigation and about three uh, uh, new trees and about three hundred thousand dollars into the tree mitigation fund as a donation to solve that. They also put a few thousand feet linear feet of sewage pipe together, and paid for it supporting Dania Beach with it, as in, we're not going to fight with you about connectivity and sewer pipe and all the capacity, we just upgrade the pipe to the tre uh, treatment plant, what we need. We pay for it. Just say yes, we pay, we plug it in. Kind of that deal. Yeah? That's how you get things done. They moved the Burger King off-site to right in the street, they had an auto parts shop, they built a separate building for the auto parts shop, made a land swap to make things happening on the other side. So fascinating. I'm looking forward. You will enjoy that. Um, I tried to get him in since eight or nine months, so finally this time will work out. Um, again, ground form and texture of ground. Ground form, what do you think about this picture? Long stairs. Long stairs. Is it welcoming or is it majestic or is it defying space? 
thing is all of that. The nice intent is being majestic. <laughs> yeah. Laza. Well, no. But it is conforming to the environment as well. Yeah. Very nicely built in, accepting that there is some structure giving by topography. I actually took the other one out. Or ground textures. This is the very boring part, but I think the visualization is interesting. Makes it less boring. Yeah. Fine, of course, we have both. We have seen this all day, everyday life. We've seen this. I'm just pointing out the obvious. Yeah. So, very quick overview. Different textures. Yeah. Just in black and white, you have a different perception on how that could look like on a wall versus how it would look like on the floor. This would be on the wall, and you're like, wow, what's that? Well, that could be landscaping, this could be the, the, uh, your patio. This? It's now a modern bathroom of porcelain, ceramic, washed tiles looking like old boat decks. Yeah? Well, they have the screws here as well. This could be like woven thing. I don't know if I wanted to have that on the wall. Or, but it, 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 you associate certain experiences with that based on your experience uh, uh, traveling. Yeah? This has a different flow than this versus this. So let's take a look at these two guys. Shall we? Yeah, you have like you know in a spa or something like this, shower. I would do this still a patio, river stone, you know, flattened out. But again, just the idea this can be rough material versus soft skin. Huh? Um, I can use this as fillers I do different ways. Just simply thinking about would you do the inverse design example and fill out large areas with this pattern or with this pattern? Of this pattern. Not with this one. Too much time. I'm going to just take a little ruler, ding, 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 do regular patches. Yeah? Again, this is black and white, so I'll give that a little bit to your fantasy ideas. Texture is safe as an example from uh, infrastructure, from um, conditions, weather conditions, and what kind of roughness in milligrams you actually have here per brick uh, uh, in the material. Yeah? So think about that um, wet street versus dry street. How long will you break with your car? Wet street definitely different. Yeah. If it's a sand pit, a sandy, uh, uh, a dirt road, will be different for your car. Yeah? That's engineering stuff. Transfer cool pavement surface characteristics, basic texture. Yeah? They have different patterns, roughness to micro texture, tire wear, tire wear, different ideas. Things you don't really think about. Now, what's the tire wear for your car? How many miles can you do with your car tires? I think 50,000. 50, what, what about yours? 30. 30? What about yours? Uh, 40. 40. Mm -hmm. Why? Because we have, A, we're dealing with different patterns of streets and we have different hardness in our, and patterns on our tires. No? If you look Formula One racing, I think NASCAR is doing it as well. They run different rubber uh, conditions on their cars, therefore they have different drift and different uh, friction to hold on. And uh, duration. And duration. Yeah. All right. Speaking on texture, what do you think about this? Sounds. It's annoying. It's annoying. It looks like acorn seat. Have you ever driven on something like that? Oh, my example is even different. <laughs> this is the walkway. <laughs> then you have some like granite looking stone. This is part of the water drainage system. Really? Yeah, a little bit. So you see that little spacing here. Those yeah. bricks is, is irrigation. And that's river stone pretty much in concrete or some other form. You're talking about riding on this as a car? I'm asking everyone in here who wears heels. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually healthier to walk on the streets. In regular, in regular shoes, that's nice, but the more you've got an inch or two, hallelujah, on no. The sidewalk. <laughs> you could walk on the sidewalk, yeah. That's a uh, small this sidewalk. Is what we call a Kopfsteinpflaster, headstone pattern. In Europe we have different patterns for that, but that's with real stone. 
There's also in Italy, in Mantua, there's a whole plaza like this. Wow. Welcome to the church. If you go and get married in that church, you got to marry a flip flops, white dress flip flops. <laughs> you can't walk on that. Huh? Just impressions. Again, this is, I put that, put that out from a random blog, but hallelujah. You're talking about texture and patterns? That's one of the examples. Let's take a look at this. <coughs> It's North, North Bavaria, Würzburg, city of Würzburg. What do you see? Smooth surface. All right. Tell us what you see a little more descriptive than just sh shouting out a noun or adjective. A bike lane coming the same way as the traffic. A bike lane coming down the road for the same lane as the traffic. How do you know that this is a bike lane? Because there's bikes on it. Oh, there are bikes on it. Okay. There's a bike on the sidewalk, by the way, too. How did they identify the bike lane? To uh, the dotted line. The dotted, the stripe, the striped lines, yeah, and? Red color. What color do we use here for bike lanes? Green. Green. Green and white lighting. Huh? All right. Uh, what else do you see? Crosswalks. Where? Here? Yeah, crosswalks. Those what about like, the street? I was going to say, that's that's really an island, because there's another street right next to it. Yeah, that actually looks like a median or something here. Yeah. 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 Transit. Maybe transit. Maybe there's a bus station here. Maybe it's an entrance to a park. Yeah. But you also can see it's two lanes in one direction, and you have at least one lane, if not two lanes in the other direction. It's something in like park style. Yeah. Um, they drop, sidewalk here, drops at the curbstone, curb is up, curb is up, not too shabby. We have, at some point, we talk about uh, complete streets, so this is almost an example. How's the social internet going with your cell phone? That one's, a, that one's a one way street, you see where it says do not, so that car that's turning is turning in this way, they're not going that way. Yeah, that's actually so, exit. So people are coming this they're way coming to merge yeah. onto the highway. Yeah. Well, that looks like a park to me. This could be actually, as you see that little thing, that they have a streetcar system, that could be actually a streetcar. Ah, just an example. What about that? Nice. It's designed. Don't know. We'll have to find it. Um, condo towers. Yeah. Different street patterns here. Definitely some waviness going on, but even in the waviness, done differently with the pattern. On the right hand side, is that grass? It's sand. Sand. That's sand. That's sand. That's That's sand. Sand. That's 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 Imagine the Hollywood bo uh, boardwalk would have like this, more distinct rather than the high-speed bicycle lane where the, the scooter guys drive you over. Yeah? Different spaces, yeah? different setups. Think about patterns, going here in squares, going diagonals, causing you to automatically, by instinct, to slow down because you're going into a different pattern and you have that bay area here to sit down. That is an accenture as well. This is the extreme case, look at that. That's the crosswalks in a different pattern. Now this is cool. That's kind of the headstone element. They are now, back in the days, you would have granite blocks like this. Back in the days when you also would have conflict in the street and there would be projectiles. Now to think about coconut size bricks, cubes, hand cut, hammered and then put in on a concrete bed. Nowadays, there are machines actually. You feed concrete in the front, and they actually pattern this with stencil. This is how technology has changed. The Dutch guys are doing it even more extreme. They put solar cells and heating cells into the uh, pathways now. Why? Because they have winter. They have ice on the street, so what they can actually do, they heat their sidewalks. Uh, if you're in areas of geothermal heat, might want to think about that too. We did um, spa development and the outdoor areas in spa development covered with natural stone for walking paths. 
we actually put piping underneath it where you flush with hot water because it was thermal water spa anyways we heated up the water so heated floors no ice no sleeping customers no liability no heated floors tiles is nice if you live in if you're in an area where you actually have negative keys used to do that by now and i built that no? so again different wouldn't patterns wouldn't you also have to do the drainage as well because the, the water flow oh you circulate it through no, but I'm saying, wouldn't you have to also improve that as well to make sure that it doesn't back up the uh, the water? Because you can have a big snowfall, melt it, and then you just overflow the system. Yeah, don't worry about that. Small area. Think about if all of this would be heated tight, that amount of snow will melt, it's fine. No? It's a confined area. It's like a little bit of an outdoor area of a... Uh, recreational center, so I'm not worried about that in this case. Alright, what about plants? Plants. Hey, guy. Depends on the weather. Huh? Depends on the weather. Depends on the weather. What else? Depends on the geographic region. Huh? Landscape architects here. How, are, how is Florida different from New Mexico? Lots of chop, chop. Uh, climate. The climate is different. Yeah? So, when I came to Florida and prepared for the lecture the first time, I figured, okay, cool, you know what? One of my pit peeves is when you look at site plans, beautiful rendering, and then a miserable little tree. Like you see a 20 year old tree in the sketch, five days old tree or five weeks old tree in the lawn. And you find examples how they actually literally dig out a whole tree, put them on the trailer, and ship them away. Then, you can see cacti. They're putting a whole full blown big cactus on the. And it actually customized drugs for that. And I was like, well, I missed a few things in landscape architecture uh, or movements. Yeah. So, again, different setups. Here in Florida, full blown palm trees are putting, being put in into the space. Been there yesterday. Completely full blown palm tree and then a regular tropical tree in that height in five to ten years is a beautiful shade giving tree. Until then, we have the promenade building palm tree around the shopping center. Uh, so keep that in mind plants for outdoors are interesting. What about indoors? Indoor? For plants? Mm -hmm. I think it's waste, waste of time. Seriously? Really? <laughs> yeah. What about cleaning air? What about giving ambience? Depends on the design. I mean, I've seen indoors garden. I was saying that's the group. It's, huh? it's it's a useful space because they they invite people to come in, have their lunch, and it's a green space, but also it's a different commercial. ambience. Yeah, they are great for noise reduction if you have multiple plants in a room. Yeah, because the leaves are picking up on the sound waves. Yeah, um, the book talks a little bit later about that. Um, there's a thing about living walls for interior design, a huge thing in terms of plants. Yeah? Um, when you actually walk into EDSA, they have all over the place, looks little, little squared buckets of plants. The whole office is full of small plants. Cleans the air, gives them the ambience, calms people down, really beautiful for high stress environment. Yeah? Um, but they need to take care, be taken care of. That's one thing. All right, perspective, detail, U-shape. This is pretty much the end of that, that chapter. Huh? Uh, yeah, how to use plans in site planning. Visual screenings, barriers, gateways, or corridors have plans work instead of walls and roads. Huh? We're using this a little bit here on the campus where you have like some bushes and hedges giving you a certain shape where you need to go. Yeah? Um, different. This is a view shed, this is more the technical part, natural environment is visible from one of the different viewing points. Um, again, this depends on where you and how you enter a space. If you come in from the door here, the view is completely different than I would enter from there. If I walk behind you and write, write on the whiteboard, 
I change your learning environment. Some of you guys are like, oh cool, he's riding on the back. Kyle is like, awesome, I don't even have to move. Others have to move completely and like, oh, what the heck is going on? Sorry for heck as in burden. What the burden is going on? Yeah. So, different perspectives. This is the technical term. This is literally from an SV web page. How we define the eye of the beholder, the view shed, in terms of what is covered. Yeah. In terms of analysis, let's put this in close up. This is how I design spaces. In this case, how I place video cameras. All the red you see is where you can't see me. Best place for pork picketing? Here. If I want to snatch your purse? Here. Uh, because I know the camera here and the other camera up here this is the blind spot. Huh? There are gangster movies made out of this. <laughs> Step like this, you're not there in the camera anymore. It's important when you do security work. You need to know what is going on with the view spot. It can be done with a view shed. Um, it's important work to be done when it comes to architecture. If you put another 42 floor tower into downtown for another day. How's the view shed of the existing neighbors compromised? Uh, best example for view shed is the building height restri restriction in Washington DC. You shall be able to see from any location to the Washington Monument. Uh, you should not be building higher than that. Oh, so Washington Monument is the top? Jeez, isn't it the Capitol building? Oh, it's Capitol. It's Capitol. 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 Yeah. Capitol. Capitol. Yeah. Um, we had a drastic, drastic event 18 years ago. Changed the view shed of New York City. Huh? With all of our souls, but in the technical concept here in this example, that landscape, that view shed, that the whole society around it, talking about places, spaces, culture, and identity was changed and transformed. You know? So keep that in mind. It's not just a technical term. This is how we construct spaces. We I mean, are in the business of constructing. Doing great with time. You're falling asleep, but I'm doing great with time. All right. These are my ideas how to read these chapters in a different way. Huh? We well, talked about temperature. Well, someone read back to chapter five or six. Um, and the idea here is just to point out a few things. When it comes to today's perception, what's today's temperature outside? It was, like, it, was like nine, or it, was it was very humid and very warm this morning after the rain shower. I was standing at 8 o'clock in front of the library. Did, did that feel comfortable? I was in my vehicle. You were going to be quiet for a moment. <laughs> Any in general idea? That, did that feel comfortable? 92, 95 outside, very humid? Depends on what you're wearing. Depends on what you're wearing. Uh, for a guy who loves sauna, living in Finland, today he was like coming in, coming out, coming out. Moving from the library into this building, it's like you walk in, it's like, oh, a cold shower. Uh, Alright, so it works in the urban climate as well. Why? Because every building has a reaction on sunlight and heat consumption, energy consumption. Uh, some building materials are really great in not saving energy as in a battery, charging up during the day. Think about that, would you pick up a black rock sitting in the sunlight? No. No. If you want to walk across the parking lot at 3 o'clock during a blue sky sunny day in Florida, would you walk barefooted or would you take shoes? Shoes. Shoes, why? It's hot. Because it's hot. There's only one way to explain it. It's freaking hot. You burn your feet with this. So, what we have to accept that depending on the environment and the users around and how we seal surface, we have impact on our heat. Locally, 
the local climate itself. Yeah? Walking in downtown to different times versus downtown Davy versus New York City, different impacts, not to mention Arizona or Minnesota, different geographic regions. Yeah? You gotta keep in mind that all of this is heating up. So no breeze. Look at that, late afternoon temperature. 92 in, uh, 92 in a downtown city area, CBD, versus like an 85 in a rural area. What's the difference between the left and the middle? No breeze. No breeze, aka okay, okay, wind. Also, um, cities, they absorb heat and they radiate from the bottom. So if you go to downtown, it's going to be hotter than going to the beach. Yeah, they radiate. They charge, like they recharge from the battery. They're sucking this in and then they expand overnight. Yeah? 8 o'clock 8 o'clock temperature and the city is still warmer than outside. Why? Because we have the building material still giradium, uh, giving off uh, the energy they absorb during the day. Different materials have different energy levels to maintain that. Like water versus air. Uh, uh, different co coefficients how they actually render heat with each other. Uh, the important thing is, the more you build this, and less vegetation, you would come in with the stereotype assumption here that you have different temperatures. Now, interesting to know that there is actually urban heat, or urban heat island effect, and there is actually publications done by the city of Fort Lauderdale, now, I'm more than happy to share that with you guys, that it actually arguing, okay, fine, we are highly overbuilt, high dense downtown, we are producing actually that heat island. Yeah? We gotta work on this. The different ways to do that. And this is connecting Lynch in the 60s with the last 40 to 50 years of development. And a nice sketch here as that if you actually have the more pervious areas you have, the more water circulation you have in an area, the less heat absorption you will have. And the more built out environment you have, but, um, Amanto said uh, you have heat retention. Huh? Or I explain it as in think about recharge the battery. Huh? Fully loaded iPhone, less loaded iPhone in terms of talking time available. Huh? Super, super simple, a huge impact. There's this weather phenomenon in Munich where in Calgary is a similar effect, where wet, wet, wet air from Italy rises over the Alps. Wet air, moist air rising, hitting barriers means they start raining. And then you end up with dry air in the Alps going north, it's a special setup in the in weather systems, UK versus Mediterranean, going north and then coming down again, picking up temperature, but can't find moisture. So you actually hit Munich with like a hair dryer on low, on heat. Yeah? Low flow with low heat, and people go nuts. If there's this phenomenon called fern, the suicide rate actually goes up, and that's cool. Yeah? People are nuts completely in Munich anyway. Yeah. But there are actually psychological impacts because you feel uncomfortable. So think about it. If I give you, as it Celsius degrees, just if I give you 10 degrees Fahrenheit, a day difference. Mister, I wear long pants today in the computer lab because it's too cold. Versus this room is okay. Could be just a little bit a notch, two or three degrees colder. I would be really happy in here. Huh? So. That kind of feel makes a lot of difference. Like you said, testing environment. Why is testing environment always so chilly? I don't know, but same thing here. We can control the environment and we can make impact as developers. Yeah? If you say, I don't want to build out my residential neighborhood like this, I want to do a good mix of this and this. It makes a change. Yeah? So when you guys develop, are you guys doing the sustainable idea of impervious versus pervious areas, or are you just saying cookie cutter, best possible thing? Yeah. If you drive around, if you just look at aerial photography, 
how subdivisions over time have evolved. It's kind of shocking and some are really like going on that. We gotta seal all the surfaces and make it more easy for the residents versus actually for the temperature. Which brings me to the point, heat islands. And there's an example Tokyo. Um, don't know exactly the story behind it, but they did this in a heat uh, uh, infrared camera. No? So if you just switch between different materials and different exposures to the sun on the roofs, and then actually the skyline here, you can see white-ish. Bright white is super hot, 30 degrees versus 10 degrees Celsius. Uh, 30 degrees, ballpark, 80, no, 95-ish, yeah. 93, something like this, yeah. Um, but you can see, wow, this looks like an oven. Anyone has a frozen pizza? Throw it on the roof. Um, that used to be the saying about Death Valley. Yeah. Yeah. It's so hot that you can actually okay. make Egg some. Huh? An egg on the hood or egg on the black top, yeah. Yeah, if you see a technical visualization like this, yeah. Same thing here. <coughs> New York. Don't know anymore what season this was, but you clearly see, remember we talked about um, dye color uh, maps, visualization in GIS, like red is warm, blue is cold, it's, uh, by instinct you say it's cooler temperatures. These are office spaces and residential towers. I would actually go, if this is a night shot, this is what now, night versus day, this is a night shot, I would go, this is the office tower, this is residential. No? I can look that up where this was. But it gives you an idea again, there is different heat retention in your urban spaces. So when we talk about, hey, how do you align your buildings here? Particularly the one with the luxury tower, the guys for fun put the uh, pool on it. You better make sure that the pool doesn't get shaken. No? That's the other way of retention because you want to make sure that the pool people are happy. Alright, there's an example for urban forestry. This is a picture taken at 9 p.m. in the evening. You can still see hot surface of the street, but look at that. Those are your trees you have. They are literally emitting cold, or rather being cold, because they are active water households. They are breathing, they are changing the environment in this moment. Like, like this earlier picture here. Huh? There's an active circulation going on. Huh? Again, something to think about how you deal with wetlands versus pathways. Huh? Noise does the same. I think you can skip that. I'm not sure if it actually still works. So remember walk score? They actually did this for the eighth, they did sound score. What they pretty much did is they took the speed limits of the city and rendered them. That's not really measured, they actually took that by corridor systems because an airport would be extremely red all the place. So they rendered that into the building sites here. But it was really cool because you could type in an address and it would tell you your sound score. Huh? Also interesting, sound. For Lauderdale Airport recently did a um, support rebuild program for windows because it made changes to the, uh, to the runway. So oh, yeah, they you, gave free windows to the people that lived in Dania, right? They gave, I'm not sure if it's all just for Dania, but everyone pretty much in that approach that would get a different noise level from the change in runway. They replaced actually along Griffin Road for sure. They actually replaced free, for free, the uh, windows of those residential units. Right. Pretty much to say, okay, you notice to the residents, you're going to get this contractor into town, you're going to replace this for free, the only burden you have, you have to be present when they do that job. A friend of mine, their place, they changed that. Mm -hmm. uh, was a little bit pain because they had like three contractors to deal with. But oh, a few thousand dollars and free windows. Why? Because they changed those windows to a different noise level and I think 
impact window level as well, so you don't even have to deal with shutters anymore. As part of we're producing more noise, we uh, compromise your quality of life with that, let me compensate you for this. But actually it comes from an Italian mathematician called Pareto, the Pareto Principle. Yeah? As in, I'm going to pay you for an easement on your land, I compensate you for it. Yeah? Therefore I'm allowed to access that little strip behind your house and put my electric utility box in there, as an example. Yeah? So Pareto improvement, basically, or Pareto principle means everyone in the room has to be better off or the same status before an action had taken place. No? Extreme example, I can't throw in, uh, it's very morbid. I can't do that. Feel it. can It's too morbid. I think about, look that up, Pareto principle, everyone needs to be better off. If I make a deal with Judson and there are neighbors right now, she, needs to, can, she cannot be diminished in her quality of life. Huh? Nuclear power plant. Or I compensate her and I pay her off that she's going to be okay with a nuclear power plant on his property. Huh? So for her potential damages, I will pay her off. So she's going to be fine with that. What's going on? Do you want to share? It if, it's, if it's class, well, then we can plug it in on the big screen. The whole team can watch it. it just start. All right. All right. Speaking of living more plants, found this small park. Look, you can sit in here. There's actually a water fun function here, and full of plants. <coughs> so green wall, waterfall, different ambience, different ideas. Huh? This is the guy who did that. Actually, this is a piece of the Berlin Wall. If an angle you can see that. Yeah. Nice promenade, trees with lights on it, nice easy way to sit down. Public art, arts installation, actually historical arts, piece of the former Berlin Wall. 1998. Gone. Some people, they still think the wall needs to be in their head in Germany. Yeah. Ah, quick images, urban focal points before and after. Took that from the UWM webpage from there, talking about noise reduction. Typical path setup, high uh, interstate uh, or ring road, residential neighborhood. What they do is they put noise reduction walls in there. We see this here all the time. At the end, you're like literally like you're in a tunnel driving. You know? Makes your driving very inconvenient because you start tiring and you're speeding one way or the other. You go all the time. Yeah. Same thing here, what would you do? Well, you put a wall on top of that. Not really the coolest way to do this, but this is a common place. Yeah. Same thing here. Yeah. They put design, don't they turn down the property value the house? Right this? Like this? Yeah. Imagine this has a small patio big enough for a small table and a small grill. And you hear, meow, 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 meow. Oh, the car's sipping by. And I was like, you literally actually had to have a conversation without the semi truck uh, hauling by and hauling uh, braking. Do that just for fun. It, Walk through a high school. It doesn't, it's all used for, uh, for light mitigation, right? For like headlights. Yeah, at night as well. So think about this. Right now, I own this house, I have the patio here. I actually can talk to you on my patio. In a nice, common voice. I don't have to yell anymore. We actually can enjoy the barbecue. You know? Versus this setup and all the, uh, the, the noise and maybe even the smell. Exhaust gas. You know? So they are really valuable, in my point of view, for the neighborhood that is next to the industry. I don't know anyone who likes it on the house. How long have you been in Florida so far? Um, on and off, 30 years. On and off, okay. When was the last time you drove down to the Keys? Yesterday. Yesterday. If you do the turnpike, you will see this all over the place. Yeah. Cookie cutter, ugly homes, when people are paying a lot of dollars for that, we can judge that by design. You know, like 
could have done better in terms of the shape and the arrangements. Yeah? But you drive down there and you see these two, two floors high noise reduction walls. Yeah, I live in Homestead. So I'm yeah. Like, yeah. So versus put all, the, put all the noise into the backyard, I think that's actually not a bad idea. Huh? Is it, is it worse than that? Huh? Is it worse than not having a room? Uh, well, not being able to get out of your backyard or something happened? Uh, no. I mean, well, you, you, still, you, you, still, still, you, you still have your backyard here. Yeah, Look, this is, you, have you still have the backyard here. But the thing, the, is, the thing is, the question here is, how aesthetically pleasing is sitting here now and watching, looking at that wall if they haven't done a good job in terms of the wall from the inside and the outside. Me, I'm driving down the street and see this wall. And I'm like, they could paint it that at least. Yeah. So there are different preferences. Um, it does it does benefit those guys because the noise at least gets reflected and thrown up in the air and not straight into that community. They do put designs in like birds and all that yeah. stuff. Yeah, they change patterns now. They actually. <coughs> You actually can see that it's not just flat, it's actually wobbly, absorbing the by texture as well, so it traps the sound. Some, some of them are actually clear, you can actually see through them yeah. because they're like the glasses. Yeah. Cool. What? Well, like, so, what, 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 are those, what are those ideas? And I'm pretty sure you'll find an architect who can give you five hours of lecture just for those noise walls, or an engineer. So, uh, I got one more. Yeah. Yeah. Twenty-eight slides in all these rooms. So many slides. Let you go to fifteen. Three. Number slide. We also have one hour more time. I'm done in about fifteen minutes, and we're going back to teams. You know. So. Full time. Can we do five minute break? Five minute break. Five minute break. I'm not a mean person. You know? <laughs> Thank you.